Yanku and uh, Professor Sunil Amrita for including me in this uh, important uh, new research workshop at Harvard University, past and present uh, of Southeast Asia. So thank you, Yanku, who is the student organizer. Uh, I've had many opportunities to try to come to Harvard physically, but this seems to be the, the only way at this point in time uh, to interact with all of you. So I look forward for your feedback. Um, as the uh, research workshop points out, uh, in recent decades, there's been a significant growth of academic interest in Southeast Asia among scholars in the humanities and social sciences no longer being seen as merely an ancillary or subfield for scholars of East and South Asia. The academic field of Southeast Asian studies has cultivated a strong demand of scholarships that focus on various aspects of the past and present of Southeast Asia. And this paper that I have been working on for some time, in part with the collection at the Herbert F. Johnson Museum, which you can see in this photo here in the background, I am Pei's beautiful building that looks like a, some say, like a Singer sewing machine. Uh, anyway, so I am Professor Kaya McGowan. I teach in the History of Art and Visual Studies at Cornell University. And um, my paper uh, for today uh, is entitled, Oh, You with a Body of Clouds, Gender and Difference in 14th Century East Java. I begin with uh, a particular quote um, from uh, the death by uh, Sumanasa Flower from Munaguna's 13th century uh, text. Uh, the hard core of the clouds was turned into an excellent building completed in the fourth rains of the fourth month. And also from the War of the Bratas, a 12th century East Javanese text by Mpusada, O oh, you uh, with a body of clouds. Landon, meaning cloud gathering, became, according to Vietnamese annals, an established entrepot for merchants from Java and Thailand as early as 1149. Just offshore from the northern reaches of the Hong Red River Delta, this poetically charged port was favored until 1485, when it was officially closed to foreign shipping, in what proved to be an unsuccessful attempt on the part of the government in Tanglong to better control revenue collection. It was during this time that Southeast Asian markets received the greatest variety of trade ceramics. Particular to this market are glazed wall tiles found significantly in East Java. These tiles, of which the fragments of several hundred survive, as can be seen here, are intimately associated with the Majapite Empire and its capital at Trobulan in East Java. It is generally accepted that some aesthetic continuity exists between the former architectural uses for these tiles, plates and bowls, in the palace environs of Majapite, and more recently, on temple gates in Bali and mosques, minarets, and courtyard pavilions of palaces in Javanese coastal cities like Kudus, as seen here, uh, with plates from Vietnam inserted into the actual structure of the masjid. Um, and Chittabon, as seen here, where the stucco molded doorway uh, has plates uh, and bowls, uh, many from Vietnam, uh, but also Delft and Holland as well. Javanese sources on the city of Majapite itself are limited to inscriptions manuscripts believed to contain historical information, information such as Prapancha's Nagarakartagama, or the depiction of districts, and foreign sources, especially Chinese. But these sources offer as little to no clues as to how these tiles and pots would have been displayed or used according to Majapite sensibilities. This paper champions the work of Barbara and Daya, who argues that, quote, despite the privileging of written sources, a more liberal interpretation of texts can open up alternative pathways, end of quote. And that, quote, the documentary dominance of men 
can to some extent be countered by attentiveness to other receptacles for historical memories. A close reading of Javanese Kakawin texts of the period, not traditionally considered historically informative, as well as ceramic tiles, pots, and temple reliefs carved in stone, will provide an emotionally charged nexus between Vandon in Vietnam and Trowulan in East Java. Points of entry for our excursions will be the fleeting moments when Vietnam, often referred to as Yavana in the Kawin, translated as Anam, meaning pacified south, a term used by the Chinese to designate a portion of northern Vietnam, is mentioned specifically in two East Javanese texts, the 14th century Nagarakatagama by Mpu Prapancha and the 13th century Krishnayana by Mpu Triguna. At these textual junctures of implied reciprocal relations, Majapahit looms large as an empire able to confer religious purifying power on its constituents while commanding a maritime polity of intense commercial activity. In this cultural and literary matrix, sacred implements and commodities are presented to readers, brides, sometimes captive, ritual pavilions, and a preponderance of pots emerge not as static forms, but as if enlivened by the splendor of their Majapahit surroundings. Intending to evoke the Indic world, Kakawin texts often divulge in ornate detail the construction of temporary installations intended for the elaborate rituals leading up to royal marriages. These heavenly encrusted implied architectural spaces can, if read against the glaze, become cultural analogs for ordering interaction between men and women in 14th century East Javanese society. It is important to point out that after the establishment of the Islamic courts in East Java in the early 16th century, the Indic literary and cultural heritage continued to develop in Bali, where courts constructed on Javanese models flourished until the colonial period at the beginning of the 20th century. Without the later generations of Balinese scribes and scholars, the Kakawin tradition might well have been wiped out entirely. Indeed, Balinese historical accounts describe the military conquest of Bali in 1343, when a Javanese king, Krishna Kapakisan, assumed the throne, establishing the powerful dynasty of Galgal, located near present-day Klungkung. The Galgal dynasty dominated Bali until the end of the 17th century. As will become clear throughout this paper, my attempt at an entry into Majapahit's 14th century capital of Trowulan is shaped by my experiences in 2002 studying traditional Kamasan painting. With a descendant from a long lineage of court painters who very likely served under Krishna Kapakisan. My view of the auspiciousness of ceramic shirts and described to me as coming from Anam one mistakenly thought to be from Thailand, and by extension Majapahit court life, its real and literary landscapes, is based largely on these embodied experiences. This provides a context, first for my intimations about Trowulan tiles, and second for my interpretation of the Krishnayana, an East Javanese Kakawin, so popular in its day that it appears in carved reliefs on Majapahit's state temple at Chandipanataran where captive women from Yavana, or Vietnam, depicted on the Pandopo Terrace, are arranged as trophies of war in relation to other valuables. In 14th century Majapahit, Java and Bali embraced Krishna as arguably much more than an avatar of the Hindu god Vishnu, or sage advisor to the Pandawa. Indic myths and heroes were localized by Javanese and Balinese kings, a two-way act of cultural and political appropriation that makes the contemporary mention of Yavana in the East Javanese Krishnayana text and its narrative depiction in stone of such salience to this discussion. Vividly carved at Panataran, these captive and potentially royal brides-to-be share a critical space with other valued goods, 
treasure chests, ritual heirlooms, and what look like vessels in the arms of the victors. Central to this gendering of objects is a passionately charged connection to sky-born transactions in motion, where beautiful cloud-bodied women sit in structures made enticingly from the hard core of the clouds. These glistening women are described as engaging with ritual implements whose material substances are clearly auspicious yet entirely elusive. What are we to make of this cumulus activity connecting royal women with their jewel-like pots? This next section is called Unfolding Like Writing, Galar Nintulis, Befriending Jewel-like Fragments of Earth and Sky. On the floor of the planquin, the receptacle for receiving offerings was of handsomely fashioned emerald. The pot filled with water for rinsing the face was of great purity. It might be described as a jewel containing the water of life. The princess more and more embodies the sweet charms of royal good fortune. Sitting in a jewel throne, she became the seat of sacred embodiment among the ritual implements. This is from Umpu Triguna's Krishnayana text. Yavana is referred to only twice and tantalizingly in Prapancha's Nagarakatagama, a 14th century Kakawin composed to honor the reign of King Hayamuruk, otherwise known as Sri Raja Sanagra, who reigned from 1350 to 1389 during Majapahit's golden age. In both instances, Yavana, translated as Anam, but originally a Sanskrit word for Greek or foreigner, is referred to by the bard as a friend to Majapahit. Prapancha describes the kingdom of Majapahit as including such distant areas as the lesser Sunda Islands, the Malakas, parts of Kalimantan, and even districts in Irian Jaya. These are referenced as part of a larger constellation of countries under protection of the king. Prapancha then extends Majapahit's reach still further, designating Thailand, Burma, Cambodia, Champa and Yavana or Anam as friends, while alluding to more long-term contacts with India and China. Slamat Muliana writes of Prapancha's Canto 83 and 84 that, quote, trade was not restricted to only that between Majapahit and the regions of the archipelago, for the Javanese merchants sailed to the coast of the subcontinent of India, Siam, Cambodia, Yavana, Anam, Tampa, and even to China. In return, merchants from these countries came to the harbor cities of Majapahit. This reciprocal commercial contact contributed to the spread of Majapahit's fame." End of quote. Prapancha's historical record is, according to Oliver Walters, quote, conforming to the literary attributes of divine kings whose glory, sung by bards, would reach the ends of the world, end of quote. In a poem entitled, Where Does the Temple Begin? Where Does It End? Mary Oliver writes on the pertinent subject of reaching spiritually beyond what are often self-imposed historically, even academically defined spatial barriers. This can be seen to relate to the efforts of Prapancha and by extension, Oliver Walters, to grasp that fluid parameter that marked the outermost extremities of what was the Majapahit Empire in the 14th century. Though not connected to Majapahit, Oliver's poem permits us to broaden the archaeologically contained site of Trowulan, where the Vietnamese tiles were unearthed, acknowledging in the process that we may never find definitive answers. Oliver, the poet, writes, there are things you can't reach, she writes, but you can reach out to them and all day. It is with Oliver's poem as a kind of methodological muse that I will begin to reach out in a sustained way toward the fragments of Vietnamese wall tiles and broken pots unearthed at Trollulan through my own initial encounter with the auspiciousness of sherds in 2002 
in the village of Kamasan, Klung Klung in East Bali. I first traveled to Klung Klung to study traditional Kamasan style painting with the artist Nimadi Suchiarmi. As with most Kamasan artists, Suchiarmi's paintings are informed by Kakawin. Whole sections of which she had learned by heart in her youth from orally transmitted sessions or papausan. Traditionally, these sessions were hosted at courts as a way to communicate knowledge to non literates who participated through listening. Often singing while she paints, Suchiarmi depicts vivid images of the natural world on her canvases evoked by Kakawin. These images are informed by the elaborately ornate descriptions of the literary architecture of the Indic world as experienced through the emotions of the characters, particularly heroines like Sita, Suprabo, and Rukmini. The ceramic sherds on which she mixes her traditional paints become part of a mirroring of earth and sky that enfolds the micro into the macro, literally the little world, Buana Alit, into the big world, Buana Agum, through a language surrounding the auspiciousness of glazes. For Suchiarmi, seemingly wet and shiny crystalline glazes that adhere and interact with clay under intense heat become a kind of standard of excellence in terms of the desired quality and sometimes color that guides her successful mixing of the raw ingredients of paint. Her prized fragments of foreign plates both point in richly nuanced ways to imagined earth and skyscapes in East Java's present and its golden past. Fragments made more auspiciously by their inscribed surfaces, galar ning tulis. The term galar suggesting motion as if, quote, looking like the spreading out or unfolding arrangement of writing. This painting by uh, Teja uh, shows Sutiyarmi uh, with her uh, uh, bowls and her sherds uh, in the lower uh, right hand corner. Uh, an example of her painting of uh, Rama and Sita and the Golden Deer can be seen uh, to the right uh, of the composition. It's from Anam, says the painter Nimadi Sutiarmi, referring to a green sherd from Vietnam. She now mixes a corresponding pale green color, Willis, on the inner recess of what had possibly once been a raised plate or bowl used by her father and grandfather before her. Her distinctive green paint was once the result of combining ochre from iron oxide or batu pere with blue dye from the indigo plant. But since Ma Agung's eruption in 1963 wiped out much of the indigo crop, she has shifted to blau, a stiffening agent used by the Dutch for the collars of civil servants. Feel the surface of the glaze, she says, as she extends the large sherd of green celadon with vestiges of molded emblems in size beneath the surface. This makes the paint flow, she says, referring presumably to the smoothness of the glaze and the comparable color. After that, the conversation shifted to sacred Mount Willis, the green mountain in East Java. The broken sherds, its diminutive counterpart, and then to reminisce of stories told about palace life long ago with green pots, like this one, once belonging to Ruth Sharp, where prized like emeralds and jade. According to Suchiarmi's ancestors, Celadon could protect the royal family from being poisoned. Indeed, a pot that contained a poison was said to, quote, speak to its owner. How? I ask sometimes by simply breaking, she says, holding up her prized fragment as if this had been its fate long ago. Another sherd of greater importance to Suchiarmi's personal development as an artist was a large fragment that came from a blue and white serving platter with a broad flat base and Steve Cavettos, almost identical to this example in the Herbert F. Johnson Museum collection. Its inscribed surface, painted in underglazed cobalt, was pointed out to me as having vestiges of an auspicious scrolling pattern called cloud letters, or 
Aksara Awan. Mistakenly introduced to me as Thai or Sawan Kalok, this once exquisite Vietnamese platter had in part been the inspiration for Suchi Army's innovative blue and white renditions of the marriage of Arjuna or Arjuna Wiwaha. where she felt a creative kinship sparked by Arjuna's face-to-face -face encounter with Suprabo, one of his many brides-to-be. The particular cloud letters on the broken plate mirrored a magical amulet of personal power by replicating the syllables for Omkara or Om or for Balinese Ang, Um, Mang and placing them literally face-to-face -face in the form of Omkara, Madu, Mukha. Such alphabet mysticism renders mantra magically efficacious, especially when they proliferate from three to five to ten letters, dasaksara. Underlying the organizing principle of these diagrammatic representations, enticingly similar in variety and shape to the cartouche-like quatrefoy, stepped square, lobed roundel and hexagonal forms of the Vietnamese tile fragments made expressly for a Javanese market in Trowulan Majapite is the cosmological compass known as Nawasanga. Itself a magical replication of Sanskrit Nawa nine and Kawi Sangha nine. Each quatrefoil or lobed roundel then could have functioned as variations on a cosmological compass pointing simultaneously toward the outer periphery of the Majapite polity while protect protecting any ornate urban structures to which they were affixed. Not functioning in the manner of tiles in Islamic architecture, which formed an interlocking pattern as a result of their shared proximity, the Vietnamese tiles made for the Majapite markets of Trowulan appear to have served as independent architectural ornaments, perhaps arranged around a belt form, punctuated by brick or stone, not unlike current configurations of tiles and plates on the minaret of the Kudus Mosque, or the outer walls of the Chiribun Palace of Kasupuan, or as they appeared on many temple and palace gates in Bali when I first arrived in 1980. At that time, you could still see Vietnamese plates and bowls like this one inserted spatially along with their Dutch, Thai, and Chinese counterparts, not only serving a decorative function, but intended as well to mark off the cardinal and intermediate directions around any given built form. As such, each tile or pot pointed to a certain direction, implying the presence of a deity, his feminine consort, a letter, a number, a sound, a color, a weapon, a semi-precious stone and other elements combining to form a rose of the wind configuration around which religious activity in Bali is still oriented. By 2002, however, most of these ceramic bowls and plates had been carefully pried from their surfaces for sale to antique shops. In some instances, these facades were immediately replaced uniformly with new brightly colored porcelain dishes. Others have been left with only their popped, marked surfaces to suggest their former glory. Still others are punctuated now with the ever-popular faces of Kalo or the one-eyed Bintulu, carved in molded and cement and said to serve a protective talismanic function. These visages are similar to the fragments of Vietnamese overglazed blue and white Kalo tiles made expressly for markets of Trouline. Whether geometric, floral, or color faced these Vietnamese tiles and the bowls and plates with their iron brown or cobalt details that appear to have largely replaced them in the 16th and 17th centuries seem to call out for a kind of legibility that lends itself to sky-born sacred syllabic utterances in the round. 
with their scrolling patterns and seemingly playful and unrestrained renditions of what looked like calligraphic forms painted in underglaze on off-white surfaces, these tiles and pots are perhaps what is being referred to literally as the hard core of the clouds in an ornate description of the encrusted surface of a bridal pavilion in the 13th century royal Javanese courtyard. A contemporary of Triguna, the bard Mpumonaguna, goes on to describe this ritual architecture in skyborne terms, quote, seven lofty roofs had the form of the seven heavens. They were of infinite beauty in the sky. It was roofed with light rain and flashes of lightning. That was why there was always a rainbow there, end of quote, in Munaguna's Death by Sumasa Flower. Like Prapancha's Nagarakatagama that reads inexorably like a turning wheel, each cardinal and intermediate direction mapping first the palace and then the larger polity's vast perimeter, Vietnamese tiles in Trowulan very likely served as a patterned force in motion, evolving a form that, like Balinese alpha alphabet mysticism, makes things happen. Returning to Sutiyarmi's reading, of the Onkara Madu Muka on the Vietnamese Sherd. Such replication in miniature is not only a site for the auspicious and temperamental mixing of a foreign substance, cinnabar red, the artist coming face to face with the goddess Durga, but it also triggers through mantra or sacred syllables and mudra, repeated gestures even of mixing and applying paint, an ever fluid trinity of forms. Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, heaven, earth, and underworld, male, female, and hermaphrodite, and finally, fire, water, and wind, a perfect elemental recipe for cumulus activity. On a microscopic level, the very symbol of Ankara on its own, with its dash as nada, brush, or linga at the top, its crescent moon, Arda Chandra, or bowl-like yoni beneath, its dot, windu, suggesting completion, and its shimmying energetic tail at the base, contains within it the microecological metaphor for its own regeneration. In this case, a baby jarlet uh, of cloud. And so we ask, where does the temple begin and where does it end? We will never know precisely how the Vietnamese tile fragments functioned in 14th century East Java. We only know that they were unearthed in the environments of the city of Trovulan. And after repeated readings of Propancha's Nagarakatagama, we are still left reaching for clues as to their very existence. Kakawin are decidedly rich in detail, but what is presented is often elusive for audiences today. Readers of Propancha can come away feeling perhaps a little like Virginia Woolf after her critical reading of the early novels of Daniel Defoe. In Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, for example, Woolf writes, there are no sunsets and no sunrises. There is no solitude and no soul. There is on the contrary, staring us full in the face, nothing but a large earthenware pot, end of quote. Instead of presenting us with landscape vistas, the early novel, according to Wolf, describes things, or rather, it presents things. Propancha's circular description of the awe-inspiring royal palace at Trowulan provides a similar experience. But what finally stares the reader full in the face is not one pot, but an entire roof peak decorated with earthenware pots. Propancha entices readers with information about the terracotta products of local potters, referred to in the text as Wijiling Kulalo, but nothing about the role of foreign ceramics and their makers. Instead of presenting us with sunsets and sunrises, Prapancha presents us with the following quote, translated by Robson. Majapait is sun and moon, the courtyard rays of light like stars and planets, end of quote. There is something more immediate and vivid going on here. We must reach into the implied architectural spaces described in the Kakawin and draw out what we can from the interstices. 
We are told, for example, in Canto 11, verse 2, that, quote, of all the buildings, none lack pillars bearing fine carvings and colored, and the substances of red brick are carved in relief, closely fitted and shaped. All around are the products of the potter serving as highest point of the roofs of the main buildings, end of quote. It has been assumed then that the royal houses in the palace were on platforms of brick with carved pillars, much as can be seen in Bali today. Drawing what we can from these details, we can easily imagine this Vietnamese light green glazed ornate pedestal found in Java, rising in delicate lotus petal tiers from the red bricks below and serving as a splendid base for the carved pillars. This then calls on our imaginative skills to reflect on Prapancha's references to color. Is he suggesting either the application of paint or the insertion of tiles or both to complement the cool green Willis pedestal beneath? We know from Prapancha's description that, quote, these ornate buildings in the courtyard were enclosed by a thick wall, quote, where the Puri, palace of the king of Majapahit and his closest relatives, presumably wives and children, lay within the innermost courtyard, surrounded by the residences of the extended family. We are also informed, quote, on the north is the ceremonial gate, splendid and extraordinary, its doors of iron adorned with countless designs, end of quote. It is presumably through this gate that captive women of Yavana were paraded along with other valuables from foreign climes. Prapancha writes, an abundance of valor and sovereign power has been appropriated by the king, in very truth the highest of rulers. At his ease he has no cares, while indulging in pleasures to his heart's desire. The most beautiful maidens in Jangala and Kadiri are selected as he sees fit, not to mention those carried off from other cities. The most lovely are taken into the palace. End of quote. While we have little to go on historically where captive brides are concerned, the Ying Yai Sheng Lan provides a glimpse of how people of Majapahit may have indulged their heart's desire with a fondness for, quote, porcelain with green flowers, chestnuts, plain and flowered linen, silk and glass beads. While Chou Wulan's quote, stunningly adorned appearance may be gleaned in part from close readings of Prapancha's Nagarakatagama or Chinese sources. Let us turn by way of conclusion to the visual affordances of a popular 13th century Kakawin by Umputri Guna, carved in stone at Chandipanataran in the district of Blitar in East Java. Here displayed in long panels of andesite, homesick brides, sometimes captive, Ritual pavilions and a preponderance of pots emerge enticingly in close proximity. Friend or foe, Yavana again appears, framed by Majapite sensibilities. This next section is called Captive Brides, Ritual Pavilions, and Bird Shaped Pots at Panataran, Reading Emotions Against the Glaze in Krishnayana. I have no desire to witness the ceremonies that will make me a bride, averse to the very sight of the yellow parasol. I tremble from the anger I feel, I will feel, to hear the regang symbols. And how could it be that the hair of my arms would not stand erect on hearing the Turing ensemble? And from Vietnamese poetry, translated by Balaban, the wind sighs, through the flame tree, so far from my parents, I sometimes can't eat. My hunger, dulled by lonesome grief, I take up my bowl and put it back down. Fill to the brim with valuable things as wondrous as heaven. Quote, such is the state of ritual pavilions described in Majapahit, or so we are led to believe from the Indic-inspired Kakawin. 
What we are perhaps not prepared for is the powerful emotional responses that some prospective brides and newlyweds express through their own physical and mental anguish at the prospect of marriage, where the taking up of bowls and putting them back down and the visceral reactions on the skin to the sounding of gongs and cymbals bring women and sacred implements into orchestrated proximity. In the first quote above, Rukmini, the female heroine of the Krishnayana, is filled with dread at the prospect of marrying a husband who her father has chosen for her. The second quote is taken from a Vietnamese poem, Cha Dao, sung by a homesick bride in the Mekong Delta during the war. These two sung texts, composed almost seven centuries apart, will serve as an orally charged bridge between Java and Vietnam reflecting past and more present battles, where critical spaces cohere around the emotional and gestural resonances divined between women and things. The monuments at Panataran Temple were constructed over a period of at least 250 years. 1197 marks the first reference to a temple inscription at this site, where King Saringa of Kadiri is described as dedicating a temple called Pala to Lord Bhattara. During the Majapahit period, inscriptions reveal that the temple complex was enlarged at least 12 times between 1319 and 1454. Most of this construction was accomplished during the reign of Jaya Nagara from 1309 to 1318, the Regency of Gajamada, from 1331 to 64, and the reign of Raja Sinagra from 1350 to 1389, whose visits to Panataran are recorded in Cantos 16 and 61 of the Nagarakatagama. Panataran functioned as a state temple consecrated to Shiva as Lord of the Mountains, and not dedicated to one king or queen in particular, as is the case with other East Javanese temples or Chandi as they're called, which honor deceased rulers in the form of religious deities. I cannot begin to do justice here to the visual complexity of narrative choices at Chandipanataran. Instead, I wish to highlight how the decidedly overlooked but dramatically salient Vietnamese presence on the Majapahit State Temple of Panataran has been utilized by the architects and stone carvers to frame the unfolding marriage by abduction of Rukmini at the hands of Krishna and the valiant but unsuccessful efforts on the part of Rukma or Rukmini's brother and Suniti, the king of Chedi and Rukmini's suitor by arranged marriage to reclaim her. The Krishna story at Panataran begins in a recess to the left of the center stairs on the front of the main temple where the king of Yavana, sometimes referred to as Kala, or Kalo Yavana, at the head of his demon army, is chasing Krishna, who has taken refuge in a mountain cave and hides behind the sleeping ascetic Muchukunda. Awakened from sleep, Muchukunda points threateningly, nuding, at the demonic looking king and his retinue. Here is the pointing gesture. Uh, and above it, the head of uh, Kalo. Incinerating them all on the spot with the power of his gaze. The panel ends with Krishna thanking Machukunda and preparing to depart with his entourage. Turning the corner to the north reveals the result of Krishna's victory, where men are shown fleeing the palace at Yavana their arms, here we are, at Yavana, their arms filled with trophies of war, treasure chests, and sacred heirlooms, some resembling vessels on the top row. Moving to the left and below is a depiction of three female captives. From Yavana, which you see there on the right, again. Being presented to two men on horseback, the next four scenes show Krishna asking a number of gods to perform miracles for his kingdom of Dvaravati, rituals that arguably say more about the supernatural and geological powers called upon to secure the kingdom of Majapahit 
In each scene with a different deity, Krishna is accompanied by two servants carrying a beetle box and an intriguingly shaped spittoon, and sometimes by two Brahmins as well. First, Krishna encounters Varuna, the god of the sea, who makes the waters retreat. Then Kubra, the god of wealth, who showers the realm with riches. Then Bayu, the god of the wind, who moves a holy audience hall to Dvaravati. And finally, here, Vishnu, to whose effigy in stone, Krishna makes offerings under a full moon. These episodes are intended to establish Krishna's powers as a supernatural being. Here, Krishna is seen on the right uh, with offerings, uh, praying before a statue uh, of uh, the god Vishnu. These episodes are intended to establish Krishna's powers as a supernatural being, manipulating the natural elements. But they do much more than this. They also, by appropriation, suggest the role of Majapite rulers who engage in friendly but at times violent transactions with allied kingdoms like Yavana. Indeed, we know from earlier discussion that Vietnamese potters were possibly commissioned to create tiles with Kala faces specifically for the trade with East Java's Majapite markets. How fascinating then that in the powerfully embattled pointing gestures displayed in the reliefs between the king of Yavana and Krishna's chosen warrior, Muchukunda, Kala heads appear above their straightened arms as cloud-like emanations. Here we see, although it's difficult to photograph, but you see the extended hand pointing here uh, toward uh, the face and above it, the Kala-like head. It is this perhaps suggesting a mo is this perhaps suggesting a momentary stay of execution, a balance of power made visibly auspicious in stone. As viewers discern, Kala chooses its victor, and this suspended scene is followed by the fiery demise of the king of Yavana and his entire entourage. These Kala apparitions in the hands of a Vietnamese ruler and a Javanese ascetic are strikingly reminiscent of the commissioned tiles from kilns in Van Don to meet with the visual sensibilities of the inhabit inhabitants of Trovulan. Knowing one's market competitively as friend or foe seems to be suggested here at Panataran in the subsequent reliefs where carvers have revealed the targeted pillaging of trophies of war, sacred receptacles taken in haste from the palace at Yavana. It is perhaps too much to presume that there is any connection between these objects in transit to Dwaravati from Yavana and the unusual skyborne vessels that appear in the reliefs that follow, each pot in the shape of a bird set elegantly and prominently on raised platforms for the ensuing marriage rituals involving Rukmini. From Triguna's descriptions of the gifts presented in preparation for the wedding, it can be deduced that these bird ewers are containers of fragrant burrat, a cosmetic unguent of some kind, placed first in front of the groom-to-be, Suniti, and his attendant, Jarasamda, as seen here, and later held in the arms of Rukmini's female attendant, in preparation for anointing her mistress. Following the required ritual ablutions with holy water or amurta at the hands of the turbaned Brahmin on the left and what might be the Sankapadi ritual. As Rukmini undergoes these rituals with fragrant substances in various vessels, some feathered, she is described as, quote, increasingly embodying the beauty of Raja Lakshmi, a fitting name referencing Vishnu's consort and pointing to the transition from Suniti to Krishna, the latter being the more fitting marriage partner for Rukmini. Krishna is also clearly the bride's choice as defined by the ritual of Svayambara. Svayambara, Sanskrit, Svayambara, is frequently mentioned in the Kakawin as a preferable form of arranged marriage. While many rituals are described in lavish detail in Triguna's Krishnayana, 
The actual ewers in the shapes of birds are absent from the text. Their presence may have been an innovation on the part of the stone carvers, or perhaps Majapite sensibilities simply took for granted that fragrant burat, itself no doubt a foreign substance, must be poured from bird ewers. Whatever the case may be, these pots appear to alight as if cloud-like amid the characters of the unfolding narrative on the Ponopo Terrace at Chandi Panataran. So you see here the little bird-like form, almost like a rooster really, a uh, pot that is uh, uh, shown here with Suniti and Jarasamba. And here's an example of a water uh, dropper in the form of two ducks, a gift from Ruth Sharp again uh, to the Herbert F. Johnson uh, Museum. Cloud apparitions have been discerned in the Ramayana reliefs at the base of Panataran. What have not been emphasized are the more refined atmospheric mists that appear in rare and intensely emotional moments of heroism on the monument, both in the form of deer-headed rainbow cloths and kala heads. These skyborne emanations, when seen in the guise of sacred exchange as trophies of war carried home in haste by conquering kings, as commodities brought by ships on the winds of centuries of trade, allow readers and viewers to make sense of these narrative reliefs at Panataran in a new way, instead of assuming as Claire Holt does, at Chandi Prambanan in central Java, for example, that the stone relief depicting Sita's abduction by Ravana presents earthenware pots of local manufacture. Scholars can suddenly question the very materialities of these royal receptacles carved at Panataran and indeed at other Javanese temples as well. Bird-shaped ewers and a water pot, Kandi, with what looks like a Naga spout either shown to accompany seated brides and grooms or displayed in the hands of a Brahmin priest in the Krishnayana reliefs at Panataran, could all conceivably be a foreign manufacture. Though kundi and bird pots of various forms were also made by Majapite potters out of local clay, a strong formalistic and stylistic argument can be made based on extant examples that the pots shown in the Krishnayana reliefs at Panataran are Vietnamese, the products of kilns in Vandon. Like Yavana's loss to Majapite's prowess, these bird pots are initially intended to mark the occasion of a traditionally arranged marriage by Rukmini's father, King Bismaka, a marriage that ultimately, like King Yavana, goes up in flames. Instead, Chandi Panataran's Krishnayana reliefs would appear to champion a new kind of arranged marriage where the bride has some say in the matter. What is more, Rukmini's marriage to Krishna reveals a mutual exchange of letters visually inserted in gender balance between the rituals with bird-shaped ewers. These letters precede, precede the perfectly planned abduction Rukmini's marriage to Krishna by her own and her mother's consent seems to be elevated at Panataran at the expense of arranged marriages by fathers like King Bismaka and by extension perhaps the forced marriages on the part of Majapite kings to captive Yavana princesses. The Kakawin scene revealing Rukmini's revulsion to her father's arranged marriage to Suniti that caused her hair on her arms to stand erect at the sight of yellow parasols and the sound of cymbals, as quoted in the introduction of this final section, is not selected for depiction at Panataran. Instead, it is bird-shaped ewers and palm leaf letters that visually dramatize the emotional transition for brides and grooms in 14th century Majapahit. As described in glittering detail in Impu Triguna's Krishnayana, Rukmini's final ceremony to set the stage for her future life with Krishna is filled with many more provocative and elusive vessels than appear in the reliefs at Panataran. As the ritual implements are introduced on the palm leaf page, many possibly glazed ceramics from foreign climes, we as readers feel first that shock of recognition followed by the burning question posed by Stanley J. O'Connor, do we really talk about pots in the same way? 
On the floor of the palanquin, the receptacle for receiving offerings was of handsomely fashioned emerald. The pot filled with water for rinsing the face was of great purity. It might be described as a jewel containing the water of life. The Shiva Patra dagger implement had the form of a lotus flower and leaves made of gemstones so beautiful that it broke the heart to see it. Its rays were brilliant, flaring up. Looking at it closely, one might say, what is this? Does it not seem to outshine a lamp? The Buka Kundur crown was made of circling plates of gold leaf like filigree, imitating the orb of the moon, while its jewels were like the constellation of the bird trap blinking up at the stars in the sky. End of quote from Umpu Triguna Krishnayanas. The ritual pavilion, complete with sacred paraphernalia and resplendent with glittering gems and sky-born metaphors, is in the end a kind of stage set for an embellished and richly encrusted poet's view of the physical charms and jewel-like beauty of a Kakawin princess. Objects resonate in these ephemeral enclosures, flaring up like flames, blinking at the stars and registering the bride's emotions and her physical attributes all at once. Such exquisite orchestrations leave readers pondering if what is being described is a glazed pot or an elaborate headdress, a lotus vase in the shape of a dagger or a hanging lamp. Our ability to define this rich materiality in motion, each as separate entities, is sabotaged by the poet's desire to fuse together a rare cumulus driven confection composed of the cloud bodies of royal women seated in pavilions carved from the hard core of the self-same material. Somewhere in this cumulus activity, as evidenced by the Panataran reliefs, pots, and their auspicious glazes, gesture toward us as both sacred objects in marriage and exchange and as commodities in transition. The porous borders between Vandon and Trawulan, Yavana and Majapahit, Vietnam and Java become blurred. In line with Wolf's assertions about the writing of Defoe, it is by believing fixedly in the solidity of these pots, bird-headed or not, in the hands of Majapite poets like Prapancha and Triguna, that readers are, quote, roped into the whole universe. And is there any reason, we ask as we shut the book, why the perspective that a plain earthenware or glazed ceramic pot exacts should not satisfy us as completely once we grasp it as man himself or woman herself in all her, his, her sublimity standing against a background of broken mountains and tumbling oceans with cloud gathering and stars flaming in the sky. Thank you very much. <laughs>